Okay, welcome everybody. I'd like to call to order our SEAC meeting of Wednesday, November 18th, 2021. I'll start off with the acknowledgements. The Durham District School Board acknowledges that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships, both historic and modern, with the territories upon which our school board and schools are located. Today, this area is home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. We acknowledge that the Durham region forms a part of the traditional and treaty territory of the Mississauga of Scugar Island First Nation, the Mississauga peoples, and the treaty territory of the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation. It is on these ancestral and treaty lands that we teach, learn, and live. The Durham District School Board is committed to learning environments that are safe, welcoming, respectful, equitable, accessible, inclusive, and free from discrimination while placing human rights and equity at the center. Um, okay, so we um, would like to begin uh, before we do roll call. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome tonight um, our newest members of SEAC. Uh, we have um, Jenny McLaughlin and um, as well as, um, sorry, I'm, I'm lost my space here. Uh, sorry, uh, my, I am really sorry. Sorry, Carissa Lewis, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, for the Black Parent Support Group, as well as Donna Edge being our new member at large. We also welcome the Early Years Consortium as our new non-voting member and the representative is Lisa Rankin. These new members will bring an important and important new voices to the SEAC table that are so important to furthering equity and inclusion of all our special needs students. Um, I would also like to welcome our guests that, that we have, uh, our guests that are following us live on YouTube, uh, as well as Nora Marsh, our Director of Education, and. Uh, Devika Mathers, the Durham District School Board's Human Rights and Equity Advisor. Uh, we have no regrets tonight, uh, so we'll just go through our roll call, starting with Autism Ontario. Spencer Annette Burrell. Okay. Black Parent Support Group. I saw Carissa on there. Did we lose her? Oh, sorry. Hi, Carissa. Uh, yep, Carissa Lewis. Okay. Uh, Durham Down Syndrome Association? Because I don't saw, see Tara yet. I don't see Tara, yeah. Uh, Ontario Association for Families of Children with Communication Disorders? Elizabeth Daniel. Okay. Um, our newest member at large? Donna Edgebean. Rowan Jar uh, sorry, Learning Disabilities Association of Durham Region. Rowan Jarvis, present. Thank you. Uh, voice for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Children. Uh, Kathy Keedy. Hello, everyone. Okay. Association for Bright Children is myself, as well as SEAC Chair, uh, Eva Kiriakides. Um, member at Large McLennan. Carolyn McLennan. Hello. Uh, Easter Seals, Ontario. Okay, I don't see Hannah online either. Um, the uh, Early Years Consortium. Hi, everybody. It's Lisa Rankin. My video is not working, but I look Perfect. beautiful. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, elementary school representation. Oh, sorry. Uh, our, our representative is Shannon uh, Robertson is unable, she's on the call, but uh, unable to speak at the moment. And we have a new representative tonight as well. Uh, Rima, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Rima Sati. I'm currently vice principal at Crothers Creek Public School in Ajax. Okay. And our secondary school rep representative? Hi, Don White. I'm the principal at GL Roberts. Great, thank you. And we will then go to our trustees. Great, Eva, Anthony's with us as well. Oh, sorry, An sorry, Anthony. Anthony, Anthony Phelan, Vice Principal at Henry Street. Great, thank you. Um, we then move on to our and, trustees. Sorry, Eva, apologies. Tammy Rayner is with us as well as elementary rep. We have strong showing this evening. We do. I'm not seeing, I don't know if I'm seeing everybody. Um, I'm Tammy Rayner, the principal at Sherwood. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we'll start then or go to our trustees next, Trustee Edwards. 
uh, Trustee Donna Edwards, uh, Trustee for for Ajax, and the Vice Chair. Okay, uh, Trustee Forbes. Hi, um, Darlene Forbes, one of our um, trustees from Oshawa. And we'll move on to our staff, starting with Superintendent McCauley. Good evening, everyone. Andrea McCauley, and uh, just extending absolute welcome to our new members. Um, really glad to have you join the table this evening. And a special education officer. Hey there, Kyla McKee, system lead for inclusive student services. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you, everybody. Um, we move on then to the approval of the agenda. I'd like to make one modification uh, to the agenda, which is to item 14, uh, association reports. We'd like to add committee reports to that as well. Um, if we could get a motion to the, approve the agenda as amended. Donna, seconders, Elizabeth, all in favor? Great. Um, okay. Um, Moving on then to the approval of the minutes from our October 21st, 2021 meeting. Does anybody have any questions or concerns with respect to the minutes from last month? Okay, if there's no questions with respect to the minutes, uh, can we get a motion then to approve? Darlene, any seconders? Carolyn, all in favor? Okay, motion passed. Um, okay, and I'd like to introduce now our Director of Education, Nora Marsh. Thanks very much, Eva, and it's a pleasure to be here this evening. I did commit to Eva before the meeting began because you have such a full agenda that I would not be long. So my commitment to you is you're going to find time as far as the timed items on the agenda by the time I'm finished, Eva. I did though want to come and uh, acknowledge everybody who serves on the uh, SEAC committee. Uh, first of all, to acknowledge what an unusual time we've had last year and this year and your presence here this evening and throughout uh, the pandemic and continuing forward in terms of new members as well. I uh, just wanted to express deep appreciation and um, to, directly say to you how much we value the work that happens around this table. Um, you know, Andrea ha has um, a real passion and dedication in terms of uh, special education, but so does the entire senior team. And she is a um, vocal individual at that table when we're making decisions in terms of remembering to begin um, with those uh, special education needs and moving forward from there in terms of what is necessary for some is good for all. And I did want to say that many of us do have a background in special education. I know that my own um, uh, career, uh, the very first additional qualification I sought as a teacher was um, my special education part one recognizing the importance of beginning with um, teaching in terms of understanding those who present unique learning needs and understanding the importance of how we differentiate and engage um, based on uh, the students who are in front of us. So uh, very committed and very appreciative of the work that you're doing. Um, this evening when we were talking about it being a, a full agenda, Eva said, well, that's a good thing because that's why we're here. And it certainly is. Later in the uh, meeting, uh, our colleague Devika is going to do phase one in terms of um, introducing the human rights policy to you. And I think this is one that um, we're really looking forward to SEAC's feedback on um, because we recognize when we're speaking about human rights and, um, you know, the whole philosophy of anti-discrimination, how important it is. Um, in terms of sometimes that bias of ableism in, in our culture and how we move forward and ensure that we are checking those unconscious biases where they exist and ensuring that every student in the system has that opportunity of uh, achievement and sense of belonging. So just uh, wanted to reach out to you and um, thank you 
Uh, I like to try to come to all of the board's committees at least once a year um, to introduce myself and to ensure as well that you know um, that the commitment through the many staff who are here um, is, I think, a testament to how important we think this work is, but also at any time um, to reach out and feel and understand that we are a team. Um, and so very happy to connect at any time throughout the year if it's of use to you. So um, I'm going to stop there because I think I am um, uh, finding you lots of time, Eva, for more, more fulsome discussion. Certainly happy if anyone does have any specific questions for me while I'm here uh, to address those, but um, and there's no need to either if, if there aren't any. Thank you so much, Nora. That, that was much appreciated. Um, anybody have any questions for, for Nora? Uh, before she signs off. I'm not seeing any. Okay. Thank you so much. It was nice to see you. Nice to see you again. And thanks again for, for your service. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we are going to move on to item number nine, uh, the staff report, starting with the administration report. Thank you, Eva, and through you, um, I'm excited that Kyla will be sharing how we celebrated our EAs this week and some learning that they've recently done, um, as well as uh, the fact that our operational plan went forward to board uh, this past Monday, and Trustee Edwards will be diving into that a little bit, um, but just echoing that it centers our board and district commitments to Indigenous rights and human rights and our, responsible, our responsibilities as duty bearers. Uh, and the conversations that that ripples and the commitments um, that we take to heart um, and the work that's being done in the board, focusing on both student learning and well-being as well in, as people and culture. Um, and so after the SEAC tonight, we will circulate a copy of that draft document. Um, just wanted you to have the frame from our trustees this evening uh, prior to circulating that. Uh, we have had a couple key ministry updates um, that SEAC, I think we'll be very interested in and potentially give feedback on uh, for implementation. Uh, so it, recently the ministry has announced um, the expansion of de-streaming uh, for courses in secondary uh, for the 22-23 school year. Um, and so the memo indicated, so this year we have the de-streamed grade nine math um, and SEAC heard um, some of that from our secondary administrators as we were coming into this school year. Um, and uh, the ministry has announced that beginning in September, all grade nine subjects will be offered in a single stream um, without locally developed impacted on that, but one stream. Um, they're taking a look at science particularly and how that then blends. Um, and then we also had a wonder about, so the grade nines that had D-stream math this year, what happens as they move into grade 10? Um, and so there will be an addendum uh, published for both the academic and applied level math courses that has the expectation of being um, implemented for September as well, specific to the transitions for the kids that access the um, first go round on the D-Stream grade nine math this year. Um, in terms of uh, protection for our kids, uh, the Ontario College of Teachers is set to launch sexual abuse prevention learning module for all OCT, so Ontario qualified teachers, um, so that includes all classroom teachers, all district staff, um, right through to our director of education and our senior team. We all carry current certification and valid. Um, and so all members between January and the summer uh, will be going through um, a prevention learning module uh, to protect our kids. Um, and the course once completed, and it was developed with the Canadian Centre for Child Protection, um, once a member completes the course, it will be searchable and appear on our OCT record cards, which are public record as well. So that's a commitment to the safety of kids. Um, and I think drawing attention um, for SEAC, because we know that some of our kids can be at a particularly higher risk of vulnerability. Um, so just draw your attention to that. Um, last week, we had a bit of a, for sports fans in the room, a TSN turning point on our special incidents portion funding. Um, for those new to the table, SIP, um, special incidents portion is a grant-based claim for which we can submit to retrieve dollars for our students who have two to one or higher ratio support for the majority of the day. So usually what happens through SIP is it's a student by student claims process. 
it's kind of like expending money on your um, line of credit and then claiming back to bring yourself back up to zero. So it's a claims process for supports already in place for our kids. Um, and it allows us to claim back about uh, it's 28518 per student, which is a portion of the staffing costs. Um, and the ministry last year had applied a formula. Uh, as SIAC will remember, uh, the committee was fantastic in supporting advocacy that we not engage a, cl a claims process in order to focus on our kids. Um, and so a formula was applied last year. And this September, we were told that a claims-based um, format would be re um, put into place for this year. Um, so working towards the December 15th deadline, our teams had begun to prepare the claims, um, missing just one piece of documentation um, in order to do so from the ministry. Last Monday morning, uh, we received a memo that the claims process was being halted for this year and that a formula would once again be applied. Um, so just taking it from an individual student by student claims base up to a formula for last year and then this year starting the claims process and then putting a halt on that and putting a formula to that. The formula that's being applied this year is last year's amount plus a 5% increase. Um, so once we got information out to the teams last Monday, uh, we did a quick calculation based on our DDSB specific statistics, both in terms of the confirmed amount we received last year, as well as the claims that we were close to and anticipating um, submission in the next couple of weeks. Um, and I do uh, assure SIAC, um, this year's TSN turning point on SIP is to our favor financially for service for our kids um, and health in the budget. Um, so we're just working through that, what that means. Um, but based on the claims that we were set to submit last year, plus 5%, um, this puts us uh, in an asset position uh, for the budget, which is healthy. Um, and so we're just working through uh, budget and finance and inclusive student services, what that means uh, in any adjustments for this year. Uh, we also thank our schools for the work. And it's not work that's unfounded either. Um, a lot of that is individual student planning and consideration where there's risk of injury uh, behaviors and or health and safety um, for the students. So it's all good planning for kids uh, that went into that. But we do appreciate it's a little bit of a change. Um, and teams had engaged that process. Um, so that was our message out. And then just finally for the admin report tonight, um, just an update on our enrollment. So these are unofficial numbers, but pulled from our Power TPM, which is our special education software. Um, at this time, we are sitting just over 12,300 students with formal education plans um, as students. And of that 12,000, just over 300 students who have IEPs outlining their programs, 2,000 435 of our kids are accessing through placement in special education classes. Um, and so that's almost at full rosters. Um, just reminding that for our kids that are in the virtual land, we had held open their roster seats in case there was a shift back to in-person, uh, which we are anticipating with the announcement of um, pending announcement for 5 to 11 vaccines. And then the final just update in, in terms of stats um, is that we are seeing a uh, spike and a, a raise um, in referral rates for our services from our ISS team members. Um, so for many of our kids who are on service, either clinically or through our um, special education consultants, which we call facilitators in Durham, um, we have kids that remain on service. September and October alone, we had an additional 1,529 students come on to service. Um, so we always see an uplift each fall because of new enrollments or a change in need. Um, but that is 1,529 additional students who were referred within those two months from anywhere from one service up to the full integrated team of um, six at that point. So um, we're just monitoring that both in terms of making sure that uh, we have service engaged directly impacting the students. Um, but also for the impact on our ISS staff as well. Um, and just taking a look at uh, making sure we're balanced from that perspective. So lots of great things for kids uh, going on currently and on the horizon. Uh, but that kind of takes us full circle as we, uh, at this time of year, start to put one toe, not a full foot yet, but a toe into planning for September. Um, 
and uh, have lots of great things going on currently for kids. So happy to take any questions, um, particularly any member of SEAC, um, but I will also circulate this so that members new to the committee can kind of have the lingo. Uh, there is a fair amount of acronyms in special education. We'll try and demystify those. Uh, we try really hard not to use acronyms, um, but we'll, we'll take a, a walk through that. But happy to take any questions tonight or through email um, as we, we build a community together. Thank you, Andrea. I see, I see uh, Darlene, you have your hand up. And then Donna. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so thank you for that. And um, I was just wondering, I am pleased to hear the SIP claims and, and the, uh, that we're mean, it's advantageous for us. I, I'm relieved. Um, uh, I'm just wondering in terms of staffing, um, like, is it, is it a challenge? Um, to, I mean, I know we've had teacher shortages, but EA shortages as well. So I'm just, uh, and I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm just wondering how that's playing out. I never find your question for you, Eva, <laughs> if that's okay. Thank you. Um, never, they're important questions. So never apologize for that. So um, we are having a bit of a challenge um, as are um, a number of our community partners. Um, when we look at our mental health partners, um, as well as ourselves, um, CYWs are stretched um, and individuals with that training. Um, but that being said, our recruitment team has done a pretty phenomenal job of keeping um, up with interviews and keeping open postings, particularly around EA supply. Um, but that is a concern uh, that's, that remains our um, one of our key stress points in the system right now um, for schools is um, unfilled EA supply. Um, so multi, as Nora said, um, I do feel privileged to work within a senior team that has a broad and consistent commitment to our kids and understanding what it looks like and sounds like for them on a daily basis. Um, so strong advocacy there, but uh, we're working on it, um, but it is not resolved as of yet. Uh, the, the unfilled numbers are coming down, but it still is a bit of a gap that we're trying to address. Fair question. Can I ask one more? I know Donna's waiting. Um, I, I'll be quick, but uh, the thing that's coming, um, and I'm I'm relieved that our programming is, you know, we're we're talking about IEPs, we're talking about human rights, Indigenous rights. We're, we're embedding that in in our practice, and it's so important, especially when it comes to meeting the needs of uh, the educational needs of exceptional learners. Um, I'm wondering though, in terms of, and I I remember asking this years ago when I was a member of SEAC, but it's kind of coming back to me in terms of student voice and engagement and engagement and things like extracurriculars and student government, uh, you know, how are we doing on that? Are we measuring that? Is, you know, how can we hook our students into these, you know, this really kind of fulsome engagement in, in school life, I guess. Thanks. Fair question. Maybe I'll start it. And then if any of our administrators want to lean in on a school specific. Um, so that's where um, within the, and I'm trying, I won't dip too much to the operational plan, respecting uh, that that is uh, a governance and, and a significant um, achievable piece uh, in terms of what we've brought forward collectively. Um, student voice is very dominant within that plan and commitment. Um, it is a specific target within uh, Superintendent Davis's portfolio in terms of how does student voice sit across all of the work of the district. Um, so in terms of student voice informing planning, um, we're looking forward to engaging that more. And part of the conversation, and uh, Devika, I absolutely welcome your input on this as well, uh, because I know particularly around the work we're doing in terms of human rights, the policy, the procedures and implementation, what we have said is we need the students to inform um, and give feedback, process um, and experience. And how are we getting at the students that we don't typically hear from? Um, and how are we building in accommodations to make sure that that's designed in a way that they can bring their feedback forward and see that impacted? Um, largely within schools, we're really seeing a re-energizing of some of those spaces that you shared in terms of co-curriculars and clubs start to come back on board. Um, but I don't know if any of our school administrators would 
do it, like would be able to do uh, a poignant job of uh, bringing forward an illustration of that. Um, Anthony or Don particularly thinking around the secondary level, but don't want to put you on the spot either. Yeah, um, ab absolutely. Um, if we're talking specifically students with special needs, um, I can say that at Henry Street, and I know some other schools as well, we have some really cool young teachers who are doing um, virtual, we call them games nights, uh, where we'll have senior students that are, um, you know, in our, in our leadership groups that will take on a, a sort of a breakout room. We use Google Meets and they'll take on a breakout room and do like a chess club with kids or do, um, you know, in one particular case that I showed up in there, we're discussing um, a bit beyond me, but some anime series um, that the kids were really into that includes books um, and uh, I guess that's manga, but anyway, um, books and, um, and and also some some movies and some television shows. So there there are things like that that we that we've been able to do virtually with kids, um, and obviously that's the type of thing that we can very easily do in person. Uh, I belong. I, I I'm I'm an administrator at school with a youth hub that we use as an in person space for these type of groups and activities. So yes, absolutely, we we can do these things. Hi, um, so I just wanted to touch base a little bit about some of the things that we're doing at GL uh, when we're looking at, because we're, we're really gathering a lot of student voice um, currently, uh, and not just specifically to our students with exceptionalities, but when we're also looking at all of our students and identity across the board. So we do have five student groups that are running. We are following this within the COVID protocol. So I have reached out and made sure with our public health nurse that when the groups are meeting that we're doing this and making sure that we're following the proper protocols. But, and I've made a point of going to each and every one of these five groups. So we are, we are looking just at our student, our student council, uh, which was one, um, one group and then we have our uh, black student association our muslim student association our indigenous sharing circles um so uh, student association as well as our gsa association and and the idea for us is um when we're bringing our kids together we're, we're bringing them together and feeding them as well because it's just uh it's kind of part of who i am as well we uh we like to eat and we talk over food right um but i wanted to really reach out to the kids and talk to them about just letting us know what they need um, especially when we're looking at their mental well-being with being in a pandemic for so long and then having to come back to the building and how do we do this and still maintain those COVID protocols that we need, but, but also support their mental, their mental health and their well-being when they're back at the school. So we are working on a few things. Um, we're going to keep building upon those. And uh, we're hoping uh, that once our community hub opens up, because we also have a community hub as well, that we'll be able to extend that. We are slightly using it just within our um, some of our small class placements. It's an extra additional space that's not just their classroom. So we do use that uh, right now. But I think it's just um, advancing and further providing the students with opportunities to use their voice and to let us know what they need, but still um, following our, our process. So I hope that helps. Hey, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, moving on then to Donna. Um, thank you. Uh, one is a comment, the other is a question, and then I have to remember my question. Uh, but the, the comment is, is I know, Andrew, you equated it to sort of, uh, you know, putting, paying for it on your credit card and then bringing it up to zero. I just want to uh, refute the zero business because, uh, you know, one of the biggest things is that we know that SIP claims, that's only an additional, you know, 25500 roughly dollars. And that nowhere covers the cost of supporting, especially when you're talking more than to support people. Um, so, um, you know, I, I agree that I'm pleased that we're, it, it's a little bit better as far as the money is concerned. But it, it, I, I honestly have to say that it, it's not bringing it up to zero. It's bringing it up to a marginal amount <laughs> of deficit, if you wish. Um, so anyways, that's just my comment. Um, uh, from that perspective, but also about the the uh, the um, the breakdown you had. Are you going to be breaking down uh, the the services the, the service that you're providing by service as well? Because it would be really or we, it would be really interesting to see that. But that's uh, a huge amount that we had an additional you know over fifteen hundred. Uh, referrals on the service. That's a, a, an extreme stress on, on services that, 
and I and I know staff are, are working very hard to to uh, address uh, issues and 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 concerns, but it's a stream lot of pressure on staff as well, um, and um, it, it's not unheard of across the whole province for right, as far as the amount of services. It's just how, uh, however, some some areas we're a little bit more fortunate that we have more services available here more locally than in other areas of the province. Um, so, um, you know, it, it still is a concern and, you know, as you said, you're, you know, you're trying to keep up with, uh, with staffing and so forth. Meanwhile, trying to support, uh, the additional workload. So, um, it's important to note that. All right. Thanks. Oh, and, and one other question, sorry, it was around the, uh, when, we, when we were talking about, you know, student voice, I, I really want to ensure that there's a conscious effort. Um, and I know we talked we pro talked about providing services or, or providing programs for students with special needs, but there's a conscious effort of getting their voice included, not a separate group but actually included so that they become part of the leadership group or if there's some intersectionality, they are part of uh, the LGBTQ group or they're part of, there's that voice that is included in there. I think it's really, really key um, to have their voice included in the various groups, not having a separate group, but included in the group. Yes, go ahead, Andrea. Thank you. So we will be bringing um, further breakdown data. Uh, what we wanted to do was kind of get over the um, transition period uh, because for some of our students, um, they're on referral and the referral is kept open to get them into the next grade or program. Um, and then the need comes down. So what I wanted to be able to do was share kind of a normalized uh, data pattern representative of this school year uh, because we do know in September and October we do have some carryover just to support transition um, and then once that student moves into a, a program or from a program uh, because some of our kids move from intervention uh, back into a regular class placement um, that that service comes down. Um, also too in terms of the service uh, data points um, the teams are working through a process by which moving from a count of referrals to more of a narrative of impact and we'll be looking for CX feedback on um, some of those data plans and how uh, because what we want to know is the trends within the service too how long is a student on a plan of care and for what are they accessing um, so that we know from a student needs perspective where we need to lean in more and where we can lean from in order to do that. Um, so we'll be bringing um, those pieces. Um, I think the other um, pick up from uh, your comments, Trustee Edwards, is um, we're currently compiling a report for Administrative Council on the intersecting uh, leadership for mental health that we take from our team here at the DDSB and intersecting with the community. Um, and I think that dovetails into where we're seeing a high pressure point around referrals as well um, as we look to integrate systems. Um, so what I will do is once that goes to uh, AC, uh, we're, we're going to move it up into December from January. Um, I'll bring it to SEAC so that SEAC can see where those community connections are um, and let us know if we're missing any um, from there as well. Um, but I'll bring that with the statistics because I think it kind of sits in the background of what we're seeing in board is how are we moving in a collaborative way with community um, in order to meet student needs. So thank you for those comments and questions. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? Rowan, go ahead. Thank you. Just um, actually questions for, for Don specifically. Um, it was it was great to hear that the the children are, are starting to get that sense of community and, and you know, getting into the groups in, in a physical format. Um, almost like a mini question, because I know just from a percentage, you wouldn't really know. Do you find that from pre-COVID, more students, because almost like they're, they miss it so much, more students are joining these groups around the same amount, or are they starting a bit hesitant because of, of COVID and things of that nature? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I, well, I will say that I wasn't I wasn't at GL Roberts prior to the um, pandemic. I just knew there this year, but I do know that uh, just based on staff, what staff are saying, we did see a huge increase in some of our or some of our student groups, and some of the student groups are new. So it is nice. We've actually in one of our student groups, we've had to break it into break it down into smaller uh, because of the size. Uh, we can't have that many students uh, together, so we are seeing 
this, uh, and personally, I'm seeing this need um, that the kids are seeing um, that they need to be with each other. They need to have these groups and that they're connecting. So uh, because of that, and I've said it's a priority for us that uh, we are providing this for them and we are providing. And, and, and again, I, I go back to the food. It's you were providing them with every, all of their basic needs, right? So that it's that voice, it's that community, it's that the, all of the social, uh, emotional um, supports that we're providing them to. And of course, right down to, to food. So uh, we are seeing a growth, um, but I'm basing that on, on the information that's been provided to me. Thank I, you. I can add a, a little bit of perspective to that actually just from a student perspective. Um, my youngest daughter's in uh, grade 12. And um, she was pointing out, uh, I guess they have broken art club into several sections of the school, but but she pointed out that a lot of students in both grade nine and 10 are really joining because for them, many of those students, it's really their first year at high school in person. So there's a first experience of uh, chance at high school life. So they're all very excited to join as much as often as the grade nine students are. So it's almost like a double cohort uh, for clubs and stuff that you would normally get. So uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, you know, so, so just from a student's perspective. So there you go. Um, and I think they were very excited to get back to their friends as well. So uh, does anybody else have any questions? Um, I, I just have, a, if nobody else has any questions, I just uh, had a question more directed towards SEAC as a group, because once we bring up this SIP thing, uh, it's probably a good time to think about whether or not we should uh, pull out and dust off our letters to the ministry. We have an election coming up in June. And I'm just wondering if we should consider uh, dusting out, uh, sort of, you know, updating and, and considering sending off a letter to the ministry, but, but not just to the ministry and maybe copying the shadow ministers um, as well. And uh, in order to can have, you know, sort of put it on the radar as possibly an election issue. Um, because it's important because um, for anybody joining us now that, that, that wasn't here when we wrote those letters, we were due to see a, I believe it was $11,000 increase in the funding that we received back. It was still a deficit, but not nearly a, a significant of deficit because I think with what they give us, the cost, there's about a $30,000 difference. And they reduced that increase to a $500 roughly increase. Um, so we were kind of right back where we started. Um, and I'm just wondering if, if it's the will of SEAC, whether or not we should, uh, somebody should make a motion to, uh, to write another letter to the ministry, um, you know, uh, asking, you know, for funding for next year to be considering that increase that, that we didn't get, that we were expecting to get. And that was done after, I want to remind everybody too, that rollback was done after budget was done and funding was done and all of that, right? So it really was a big hit to to this the special education coffers, really, and the school board coffers. So, Darlene? Sorry, I remember when we wrote that letter. So <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Um, and I was just wondering, I think it's a great addition to include the shadow ministers uh, from the other parties. So I'm assuming you mean like the, the ministers that have. The yeah, the, yeah. 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 The, cri the, the critics. Yeah. Yeah. And um, sorry, I, I don't know what the names are, but um, I was wondering too, if um, we, we might want to include our Durham, I don't know, uh, elected officials as well, like the, the MPPs, or is that too much? I'm just throwing it out there. Well, the Durham, you know, there's the Durham MPPs for sure. I mean, there's not, mm -hmm. there's not that many of them. So I don't think it would hurt. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like we might have the last time, but I still have the letter saved. Uh, I know exactly where to find it. So, um, so I, I can pull it off, pull it up, dust it up a bit, you know, dust it off and, and update it and then uh, send it out. I think probably the, the big thing I would want confirmation on is, the actual sort of the current, uh, you know, average cost of that extra 
person, you know, assuming it's just one and not several, right? Depending on the needs of the student. So, um, but that's something I can, I can reach out for as well. So, you know, if, if it's, it's a will of SEAC, we could certainly do that. Does anybody want to make a motion? Sensa? Seconders? I can't see everybody. Kathy, all in favor? Okay. Uh, motion is, yeah, I see it. Elizabeth, okay. Uh, motion passed then. Um, I will do that and try and get a draft out. So it's a quick one because it's just an update. So, um, okay. And that was, that was sort of my only addition to that, the administration report. Um, if we have no further questions, uh, we should move on then to the board reports with uh, Trustee Edwards. I'm going to make it really quick. And I wasn't going to go into great deal, a big deal about the uh, our, our action plan because we do have a full agenda and I really wanted the human rights. But um, what I'm going to tell you is that, uh, of course, the draft operational plan did come forward. Um, and it's, of course, based on our, our, our six pillars of, of, uh, from our strategic plan, but centered around looking at outcomes around two uh, key areas of outcomes around student well-being and learning and people and cu culture with Indigenous rights and human rights as the, the core, as uh, Andrea had said. Um, and there are basically about six guiding principles um, from that that uh, were guided the, the creation of the opera, uh, operational plan. And, and we talked about integrating the Indigenous rights and human rights and anti-oppression equity. Intersectionality uh, was basically the focus of, on, on all dis discriminatory and racist barriers. Engaging and, co and consulting and building a, a relationships with students, families, uh, our employees and our communities to to um, to inform and make sure our services and our, our and supports are responsive, um, as well as our decision making um, is, is reflects the uh, the information that ha we have received, and be very trans trying to be very transparent about our processes and and clearly communicate. Um, our actions and outcomes from our strategic, uh, from our uh, action plan, and uh, fostering um, uh, approaches that encourage um, innovation, equitable and responsive processes and practices, and basically upholding our responsibilities around account accountability through our our data collection and feedback and reporting. Um, so there were uh, there, there were some of, some of the errors around you know examples of what uh, what we're looking at is in the action plan for people and culture. So I just and, and uh, but I don't want to go into all of them because as I said I think we we've got a lot to deal with with uh, uh, the policies coming forward. We also had our um, annual. Um, our audit uh, report, um, and we had a report on physical education and athletic, uh, extracurricular uh, activities and protocols. Um, we had a report from our parent involvement committee, and I know that uh, Sensor Rainab is going to be talking about that later. Um, and um, of course, we approved the membership, the new membership, um, uh, to um, uh, uh, to uh, SEAC. Uh, we also had a, a report, the annual report from Durham Student Transportation Services. Um, and uh, we talked about some of the things that uh, we would like to see as far as uh, reporting. So if you're interested in this and ridership and, and, and so forth and uh, ridership times, it's all in that report. Um, and and uh, I just wanted to key on a note because I think I mentioned at the last last meeting um, that was something to think about as far as future projects and the, uh, and again uh, the fact that it was mentioned about a, a provincial election coming up that the Ontario Public School Board Association does uh, provide a template um, for create for debates. 
um, as election time comes up around focusing around education. And uh, I mentioned before, we did hold uh, we did hold one in the last provincial election um, in Ajax, and we had everybody attend. Um, but some of those the items that we're talking about are, are key questions that we asked um, each of the the parties. Um, around special education, uh, as well as anything to do with education, um, because there's another note um, moving forward, and I think I've, you know, I've, we've talked about, uh, and our, our committee had put a response around the K to 12 um, uh, education standards uh, development committee's report, and we put a response, which was in uh, provided as well. Um, and I can honestly tell the, the deadline has passed and we're looking at, um, uh, as I sit on the committee, we're reviewing all the feedback. We've had significant amount of feedback, but I can honestly say that at this point in time, the feedback is fairly positive, like extremely positive for a lot of, a lot of the recommendations in that, in those reports. Um, uh, and, you know, percentages, depending on the barriers uh, of recommendations, are, 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 like range anywhere from 72 to up, uh, sorry, yeah, 72 up to 86% or something like that right now as this is expands. So that's very high percentage of support for those recommendations. So it would be a thing. Um, one of the concerns, though, is that we're trying to get this thing, the standard has to still be developed. This is our report. Um, and our concern once we go into an election year that all all that work is going to be lost and that um, whoever gets in um, might not follow up on creating those. So that's another key issue that may be put into sort of that uh, education debate, but it's something that we can think about. So anyways, that's my report. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Does anybody have any questions for Donna with respect to the board report? No? Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll move on then to the Inclusive Student Services Department report with Kyla. Hoping everybody can see my screen. It's always a test run. Um, you should have a copy of this slide deck in a package that was shared, so I'm just going to highlight a few of the slides. Um, looking oops, first at slide two, uh, just in partnership with the Durham Catholic District School Board uh, for the past few years, we have partnered with them to acknowledge and recognize educational assistance on the third Wednesday in November. This year it was uh, yesterday on the 17th. And uh, so just one way as a board that we recognize this important and valuable work of our frontline staff, our educational assistance, as we know, are essential in the support of our students. And we want to make sure schools recognize their contributions in a public way, which there were lots of examples. Uh, this is just a few samples of tweets that were found. And we have always had a bit of a hashtag running each year to be able to acknowledge and celebrate the many ways that schools were recognizing and acknowledging. So our schools posted their efforts in a variety of different ways and uh, saw lots of great things happening around the system. We also wanted to share that uh, this past Friday was a professional development day for the system. And we were able to bring a variety of professional development uh, activities to this group uh, as educational assistants. But we wanted to highlight one in particular, and that was Dr. Robin Hanley Defoe. She is the author of Calm Within the Storm, and she gave a message of everyday resiliency. And she focused on some practical strategies to help our frontline staff be able to take care of themselves while they also take care of our kids. She offers five key pillars, perspective, belonging, acceptance, hope and humor in order to create hope forward. And I really loved her message that uh, she was raised with, but it uh, became really essential to her. And actually, uh, she would tell you it saved her life one day. She suffered a pretty traumatic car accident. Uh, but she says we can do hard things. She was brought up to believe when she would say, "I this is hard, her mom or her dad would respond with, you can do hard things. And that, that's with the firm belief that you can. And we can also do great things when we trust and believe in that. So we intend to bring Dr. Robin back in the future to continue this important learning. I'd also like to highlight for you in the package, uh, page or slide six. This is the guide to remote learning for students with special education needs that was put out by uh, the ministry. 
And so just wanting to let you know at this point, we are going to bring this uh, back once we've had some time to dig into it a little bit deeper. But for right now, there are some recommendations listed in the package. And where we're at is unpacking it and collaborating with a number of people. We have our innovative education team, as well as the inclusive student services team. And they're partnering with our DDSB at home staff to be able to evaluate what we did do over the past 18 months virtually, how well did we do it, and what's next for us. We're going to use this feedback and collaboration to establish some next steps and the sharing of promising practices. And our intent is to bring this information back to SEAC and share it once we've explored it further. And we'll then welcome SEAC's input about how best we can share this guide and our accompanying information based on our collaboration with families and, uh, and through your organizations. I'd also like to highlight slide 11. You may remember that we've had a, an event titled Life Beyond High School. Um, you may also remember that we participated in a pilot project with the ministry that uh, originally supported the addition of a transition coordinator, and now that is a permanent member, and now it's both Braden and Sade. Last year, because of COVID, our normal event that would have all of our community partners um, joining us in the atrium of the Ed Center for parents and families to be able to come in and connect with them, we weren't able to offer that. So last year, we created a Google site that uh, had the opportunity for all of these organizations to be able to provide us contact information, any uh, important information they wanted shared with families, and really just a one-stop shop for our families to be able to go to to learn a little bit more. Um, in partnering with those other boards in that uh, project, we learned of a couple of boards that had done both. They'd created this sort of web-based resource, but then also added a virtual event. So our intent this year is to do that, and it's going to be December 9th at 6.30 uh, live. Registration will be going out shortly. And so we uh, ask for your support in making sure uh, the families and, uh, and people that uh, you support are aware of this. We'll provide the actual flyer and details to SEAC when it's available. And then because we're going to have a few of our keynote speakers, um, which will be representatives from the community partners, we know that's nowhere near enough for some of the families wanting to have that uh, next level of connection. And also they may have some specific questions. So we're going to develop a workshop series from January right through till April that adds a few more of these contact points. And then we also add a grade 8 to grade 9 central transition night. And the goal of this night is to be able to have our families of students with exceptionalities and special education strengths and needs be able to come in and hear a little bit more about how those structures change from elementary to secondary. We offer some um, more opportunity to figure out what questions they might want to ask or things that they may be able to ask us that then they can go and find the follow-up question or the next level question when they go to attend the local event for the high school that their child is going to be uh, attending in, in the fall for their grade nine year. And then the last slide I wanted to bring your attention to was this one about critically conscious book talks. Because of time, I had planned to maybe show you a short one just to be able to give you a bit of context. But instead, I just want to share that um, we have the Student Achievement Department who's been working over the past year to continue to develop resources for culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy. And this included a series of book talks where they shared some key picture books with important messaging that can be leveraged as what we call a mentor text. And a mentor text is a book that's selected with purpose. It has some intentional pre-planned questions that the teacher would have ready and, and thinking about and pages they know they would stop at and just some wonderings that they might mention as they pause and focus on these specific big ideas throughout the books. So this series of books has things like bias, language use, important themes to help build capacity in our students to build inclusive practices in our classrooms. The Inclusive Student Services Department is partnering with Student Achievement to be able to add to this library of these critically conscious book talks with a focus on neurodiversity. So we're inviting all of our SEAC groups and organizations to be able to offer any names of a picture book that you would recommend from your organization or from your own learning that would be a, a great addition to this project. So if you are interested and have a title for us, if you can just send that to Lisa Rye, we'll take them to the project team for planning and consideration. We have several great ones that have been selected and we have our um, a, a neurodivergent uh, affinity group that's been supporting us there as well. 
but uh, we're eager to hear if uh, SEAC would have any other um, ideas or suggestions for book talks. So uh, we invite you to share that uh, request at any time. And I'm just going to stop sharing and then see if there are any questions. Thank you, Kyla. Do we have any, any questions for Kyla with respect to the um, student, Inclusive Student Services Department report? Okay. Um, if there's no questions, then we are going to move on to our presentation with uh, Dev Devika Mather, um, our Human Rights and Equity Advisor, um, on our new human rights policies and procedures. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you and good evening. Uh, my name again is Baby Gamather and I'm the Human Rights and Equity Advisor for the DDSB. And my pronouns are she and her. It's great to virtually see many of you again and also nice to meet and welcome the newest members of SEAC. Um, Kyla, are you able to put the slide deck up? Oh, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to the chair and to uh, Superintendent McCauley for making some time on the agenda for a brief presentation and overview of our new policy and procedures, draft policy and procedures. I'm really happy to share that with you. And so, as you may know, we're in the process of developing um, a new human rights policy and we're seeking input on it through a broad consultation process. So I have a short presentation on screen and I understand a copy of it along with the full policy package has been shared with you. Uh, if you don't have it, please let me know. I'm happy to share it again after tonight. Um, but otherwise, I'll just dive right into the presentation. So next slide, please. This is really a quick overview of what we'll briefly cover today. I'll touch on the policy development process and then provide a summary of the policy, the related procedures and the, um, the next steps as well. So on the next slide, just in terms of a little bit of a recap, Last year at around this time, we brought forward to SEAC a framework for developing a new human rights policy for DDSB, and the framework and the related materials are also available and posted on our website, and the framework outlines some of the main themes or areas of focus for the policy and procedures, and it also included a consultation plan that covered wide engagement with students, with families, uh, employees, and with communities and community partners partners. And it was meant to be a two-phased consultation process. And so that first phase was really just to seek input on the framework. And that phase was completed last year. And as part of that process, we engaged or met with students and all of the other groups that you see here um, through surveys, through thought exchanges, social media, and other methods to invite feedback, <coughs> excuse me, and to seek some input on the framework. And for phase two, we committed to then take all of that feedback on the framework, draft the actual policy based on that input, and return to all groups to share the draft policy to make sure we got it right, and also to then invite further feedback on the draft policy itself. And so that's why I'm here now and what brings me here today. And so in terms of the draft policy content, it is consistent with what was in the original framework and incorporates a lot of the feedback from that first phase of the consultations. And the policy is also informed by, <clears throat> excuse me, legal requirements under the code, um, as well as other legislation. And it also aligns with policy guidance and resources from the Ontario Human Rights Commission, the Anti-Racism Directorate, and the Ministry of Education. And so we now have a new draft policy and procedures to go along with it. And I'd like to take you through that really quickly. So here on this slide um, is just a high level overview of the draft policy. And I should say that what is in the presentation today is really high level. The actual documents have um, significantly more detail and they're quite long and lengthy documents. Um, but for the policy, it has several statements about our commitments to upholding human rights um, and includes key principles and requirements under the Human Rights Code. Um, it also acknowledges the existence of systemic discrimination and racism in our learning and working environments and the negative impact that that has on students, families, employees and communities. And it also sets out our approach, what action we will take to prevent and to address all forms of discrimination. And this includes embedding human rights principles into all of our decision making and in all areas across the system. Um, and the policy also outlines what we're calling duty bearer responsibilities, which I'll go and you heard, I think, uh, Superintendent McCauley mentioned it earlier as well. And I'll go into what we mean by that on the next slide, please. 
Um, so this slide outlines a key part of the policy, and that is the relationship between rights holders, so all of our students and all of our employees, and what their rights are under the Human Rights Code. Um, and so, for example, and I know you're already very familiar with this, students, students have the right to access education free from discrimination, to be treated with dignity and respect, and to be in to equitable um, educational experiences, opportunities, and outcomes. And what the policy also covers is what the district's duties are as both an educational service provider and an employer to protect these rights and to provide welcoming and inclusive environments to identify and address discriminatory barriers and to correct discrimination when it does happen. And so I'll go over what we mean by that a little bit more on the next slide as well. So on this slide, um, it shows a foundational part of the policy and the procedures. And it's around our, what we're calling our duty bearer responsibilities to promote and protect human rights. And that includes giving people information about what their rights are and how to assert them so that they're aware and they know where to go if they need help or if they need to um, raise an accommodation request or file a complaint. Uh, identifying and preventing and addressing discrimination and discriminatory barriers in our schools and our work places and designing services inclusively, um, responding to human rights issues and barriers, including the duty to accommodate, um, and learning about human rights so that we better understand how they apply to our day-to-day -day work, to all of our practices, and to our decisions. And then again, correcting issues and incidents of discrimination if and when they happen. And so the policy outlines what is considered a violation or a breach of the policy and what steps will be taken and what the consequences can be. And the policy and procedures explain what all of these mean and what we will do in each of those areas in much greater detail. And they focus on creating inclusive and accessible environments, affirming all identities, and making decisions that uphold human rights, anti-discrimination, and anti-racism. And on this slide about policy principles and objectives, this is just a few of the key principles and objectives of the policy. And among other things, and um, it was referenced a little bit earlier as well, was, is around centering student voice and meaningfully engaging with communities. Um, one of the other principles is that we're applying human rights, anti-discrimination and anti-racism principles and approaches to everything that we do, that we're taking... <clears throat> excuse me, proactive systemic approaches to addressing discrimination that will measure and evaluate how we are doing and also that this is ongoing learning and work so that it's not a one and done. We have, it's, it's an ongoing process and that we all have individual and shared organizational roles and responsibilities to uphold human rights. And this will help us all make decisions and take actions that uphold the rights of all DDSB community members that are not discriminatory. And the policy focuses on addressing all forms of discrimination, uh, racism, ableism, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, faithism, and religious discrimination, and intersectionality as well. Um, so on the next slide, this slide is really just an overview of the policy package that you've received. It is one overarching human rights, anti-discrimination and anti-racism policy that covers all DDSB community members in our learning and working environments. And to support the policy, there are three main procedures. Uh, the first one is about proactive prevention and focuses on human rights, anti-racism, sorry, human rights, anti-discrimination and anti-racism. And the second one is, um, is focused on inclusive design and accommodation. And the third one is the process for students and families to raise or report human rights issues, incidents, and complaints. Um, and the last one here is for staff only, and it's just to signal for you that we also have updated our existing workplace harassment procedures to include human rights for employees as well, so that we're uh, better supporting safe and respectful workplaces for staff. And so together, the policy and these procedures are expected to help us meet our duty bearer responsibilities to promote human rights, um, and to prevent discrimination, address barriers, and respond to issues. And though, I'll not, not, sorry, and although it's not shown here, it also includes a glossary of terms to define and explain what uh, some of the key human rights related terms and concepts are that we use in the policy. Um, and a, cutting across all of those, oh, sorry, sorry, Kyla, if you wouldn't mind going back one slide. Thank you. Um, and cutting across all of those is a human rights roles, responsibilities, and accountability framework. And I'll touch on all of these briefly over the next couple of slides as well. So next slide, please. 
Um, the first procedure is the one that focuses um, mostly on prevention, and it takes the policy objectives and those duty bearer responsibilities and lays out where and how they operate and how they apply in our learning and working environments. It also includes some concrete actions and guidance to help identify and address discrimination and discriminatory barriers in our practices and, it, and in our decision making. And really, it's about applying those human rights principles to everything that we do. Um, it includes specific references and actions to address ableism and to incorporate incorporate accessibility principles into all of our work as well. And while there is an emphasis on schools, on classrooms, teaching and learning, and other areas that affect students, it also includes all of our other practices. So for example, our community partnerships, um, all aspects of our academic services and our corporate services departments, including IT, human resources, and facilities, all of our system departments and all of our organizational plans and initiatives. And to the conversation that happened earlier around student engagement, and Superintendent McCauley said it really well, that includes our engagement strategies and our engagement plans also. Um, on the next slide, please. Um, so this is the inclusive design and accommodation procedure, and it works alongside the previous one in that the previous one includes steps to design inclusively, to design our services and learning environments with everyone in mind. Um, but when the barrier, when barriers still exist, it explains the accommodation process, all parts of it. So from communicating about the availability of accommodation, uh, proactively offering accommodation, how to raise a request, um, the duty to inquire about accommodation needs, what supporting documents we might need, um, accommodation principles, the duty to accommodate, including roles and responsibilities and all of the procedural steps around exploring options and solutions and developing an accommodation plan as well as monitoring for new or changing accommodation needs. And it also then addresses undue hardship, what it means, what it is, what it isn't, um, how it is assessed, and the processes around all of these things. Um, and then it also includes addressing unique barriers and unique inclusive design considerations that are based on disability, um, as well as gender identity, gender expression, creed and religion, and intersecting identities. Um, and this section or this procedure um, and, and particularly the pieces around accommodation and disability uh, was informed by the OHRC's policies and guidelines on accessible education for students with disabilities. And we're also closely following the draft K-12 education standards recommendations report and uh, the OHRC's right to read inquiry to see how those might also help to inform this section as well. Um, next slide, please. So this procedure is uh, the student and family human rights issue incident and complaint resolution procedure. And it outlines the ways in which students, families and community members can raise human rights issues, incidents and complaints involving employees under the new policy or the new draft policy. Um, and one of the key parts of this procedure is that when an employee becomes aware of a potential human rights issue involving a student, they must report it to their principal or to their manager. And if an issue is happening in the moment, they must take steps to intervene and to stop it and to report it. And so those reporting requirements then trigger a series of steps to respond to the issue, even if the student or their parent or their guardian hasn't filed a complaint about what happened. Um, but that said, the student or their family can still raise a complaint or an issue. And, you know, one of the things that we really uh, spent a lot of time with on this procedure in particular was the recognizing that complaints processes and also the accommodation process. Um, it's in general, it can be hard to understand and it's hard to navigate and work through some of the steps. Um, there are a lot of legal principles and steps that we need to follow and that this can create barriers and challenges to access these processes and can also be intimidating for people for a lot of different reasons. So to try to minimize that, the procedure sets out options for raising concerns to give families choice. Um, um, and so one option is to raise the matter directly at the local level if they feel safe doing so. So for example, with their teacher or their principal or another staff member at the school. And the procedure then outlines what steps that staff member must take to address it, including additional reporting requirements. Um, or where a student or family prefers to file a complaint or where they've already raised it as an issue, but it hasn't been appropriately addressed. The second option is to bring a complaint forward to their superintendent. And depending on the nature of the complaint, there are then potential options for resolution, uh, like a mediation or a restorative practice, or it may require a more formal investigation. And the procedure outlines what each of those steps are and what they would involve. 
But either way, whether it's an issue raised locally or a complaint raised to the superintendent, the district will take all human rights issues and complaints seriously and will not ignore or um, condone any allegations of discrimination. And the procedure outlines how we will do that and how we will hold ourselves accountable to that. Um, the procedure also sets out what will happen if discrimination is found to have happened. So what the corrective, remedial or disciplinary responses could be up to including termination of employment, as well as learning needs for the organization. And then there are also requirements to monitor and follow up after incidents and complaints to see if further action needs to be taken to resolve the, the matter. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and this outlines the human rights roles, responsibilities and accountability framework. And it outlines what our individual responsibilities are in much greater roles. So taking those duty bearer, or sorry, much greater detail, taking those duty bearer responsibilities and applying them to the various roles and at different levels across the district, as well as organizational actions that we need to take to uphold duty bearer responsibilities. And then it also includes several um, accountability mechanisms to demonstrate how we are meeting those requirements. Um, and this supports all of the procedures and includes requirements around data collection, um, analysis, evaluation, and public reporting, and other communications so that we're transparent about the work we're doing, and also so that we can measure if we are meeting the objectives of the policy and how it's impact and what the impact is. And so together, the draft policy, the procedures, and the accountability framework um, together have a focus on proactive um, and preventative and responsive actions and the steps we need to take to, to fulfill our duty bear responsibilities. And the intent is to clarify through these procedures what we need to do, but also what we need to do differently to uphold human rights for everyone, uh, regardless of ancestry, race, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, creed or religion, or any of the other human rights code protected grounds. And it's also about putting in place or, ex or enhancing um, existing ways to support an organizational culture of human rights that is accountable to the students and the communities that we serve. Um, the next slide, I won't spend a lot of time here. This again is just the procedure that's specific to employees and it's really a revision to our existing workplace harassment policy. So the revision, um, the policy now includes discrimination and outlines the employee complaint process um, as well as supporting safe and respectful workplaces. And I just provided it here for information. Um, next slide, please. Here, I just wanted to point out that both the accommodation procedure and the student issue and complaint resolution procedure also have a number of common elements. There's a strong focus on accessible ways to bring forward accommodation requests, issues and complaints. Uh, there's an emphasis on confidentiality, uh, supports and safety, um, including protection from reprisal or retaliation for bringing forward an issue, and uh, keeping parties to a complaint or in an accommodation process informed throughout the process, keeping them apprised of any delays and the reason for the delay, um, ways that will address potential competing right situations, um, again, I mentioned it earlier around the data collection and reporting, but it's also to identify potential trends and potential systemic issues. Um, and to the previous conversation around engagement, we're also looking at collecting different types of data around student experiences and access to opportunities, as well as outcomes. Um, and then looking at system organizational learning needs and actions that we might need to take uh, to prevent and address the data, what we're seeing in the data as well. And what they all, what they both also have in common are built-in consultation requirements to support key steps and decision-making points so that we're consistent in our approaches and so that we're appropriately applying human rights, anti-discrimination and anti-racism principles and expertise to address the situation. Um, we're also working on developing accompanying forms to help students and families submit complaints, but those forms aren't required if there are accessibility or, or other barriers. And we'll also have templates to document and record what actions were taken to address them. Again, this is all around the pieces around accountability and consistency. And we're also developing, and it was a lot of materials that I'm sure you saw, um, but we're also developing simplified policy and procedure summaries and process flowcharts to hopefully make it a little bit easier to understand the steps and the options that are available within these two procedures. And those forms and summaries will be part of the final draft package once the content and the procedures is finalized. Um, 
Next slide, please. So I know that was a lot of content. It's a big policy package with a lot of materials. Um, and in terms of next steps, we'll be launching phase two of the community consultations, hopefully tomorrow. You're actually seeing uh, the materials before we're going uh, through with going forward with a live launch. And we have a full uh, package of materials on our website, um, along with the summaries and a short video that explains what they're about. And we're inviting feedback via survey, via email, by phone, um, also going to other board committees. So I presented to uh, the current involvement committee last night and we'll be attending other committees in the coming weeks as well as engaging our community partners for feedback. And we're also planning a public information session. The date is not yet set, but we're looking at early December and we'll communicate the date through social media and through other channels. And we'll also update our webpage once the details are confirmed. And recognizing that despite all of those ways to be able to provide feedback, there might still be barriers for, for folks to participate. Um, again, we're looking at ways in which we may be able to invite feedback through other means if these ways are not accessible. And we'll then take all of the feedback and make any revisions needed with the aim of bringing the package to our board uh, governance and policy committee in January. The date is not yet set, but uh, we'll, that's what we're aiming for. And then that will then trigger the next steps in the approvals process. Uh, next slide, please. So I know that was a lot to take in. I went through it very fast and there's a lot of materials and you, mean, you might need some time to process and review the materials that were shared on our website, um, but I'm happy to take any questions or feedback now. Um, and also I should flag and apologize. I believe that one version of one of the documents in your package, I think it was the accountability framework, may not have been a fully accessible version. So I'm sorry for that. I'm happy to share an accessible version separately when I've got one. Um, and we'll be sure to share the link to the consultation page with the full policy package and the summaries before, uh, sorry, when we launch. Um, and we invite and very much welcome and appreciate receiving any feedback that you may have. Um, and if I may, once the consultation is officially launched, we would also kindly ask for your help in spreading the word about this opportunity to provide feedback. Uh, we are trying to engage as many people as possible and would really appreciate if you can share uh, the confluence, uh, sorry, the consultation information with your networks in the district. Um, and then on, just on to the last slide, this is just further information in terms of where, where people can submit feedback by email, by phone, or through our consultation webpage to access the survey or the other materials. Um, and just to note that this link might not be active yet, but it will be once we launch, and we'll be sure to send the materials um, out to everybody when, when we do launch. Uh, so thank you very much again for your time, and thanks again to Eva, sorry, to the SEAC Chair uh, and Superintendent McCauley and to the whole committee for your time on the agenda today. And thanks to Kyla for working the slides for me. Um, happy to take any questions if there's time, or also I'm very open to coming to your December meeting uh, for further feedback, if that would be helpful, and if there's space on your agenda. Um, I'll answer that last question now. Yes, we would love to have you back in December and have that, um, maybe have our uh, presentation and possibly discussion period all in included because I think this is a, a very detailed uh, endeavor and I think uh, it's really important that we are able to give really in-depth and, and meaningful feedback on that. So for sure, uh, please. I see that Donna, you have your hand up. And and it is a very comprehensive document, and I and I know that later you're going to be doing guides. But I just uh, when we're doing the consultation, I just look at at the the depth and the breadth of the document, and sometimes um, uh, having such a huge document, you know, having trying to get uh, a, a feedback on it is going to be uh, it, it, it is difficult because they are so large documents and I'm almost thinking that you somewhat have to have the guide but um, now I haven't I don't know if the, I haven't looked at the video or, or whatever but I'm just wondering are the videos themselves accessible uh, like I mean that's that's the the biggest thing and I you know um, because before and I look at because I know one part there's also 
you talk in and talking about the accommodation for parents and that they have to submit a form. Well, is that form going to go up to the board office where it's going to sit for a couple of days and then finally get to the school when they're only going in to have a meeting at the school sort of thing? So it's how complex do you make that? And so um, to making sure that there, those forms are accessible, uh, ready, available, because it might not be one that needs to go to the board office. And it just needs to go to the school so that they're aware of a parent's needs uh, attending that. Uh, it would be a different thing for an event that was being held at the board office or a school where you'd have to have more people. So, I mean, it, there, uh, the design of that and, and the design of those forms and so forth should be reviewed by people with accessibilities, lived experience with accessibilities, because um, honestly, uh, I, can, I can give you a great example of the, the recent uh, issue around uh, uh, the... Um, the vaccination, the QR codes where a uh, person who uh, who was blind had downloaded it onto their computer because they couldn't do it for their phone. So they had their access to the tools. Or so. And at the very end, it says, please take your phone and to the screen and take a picture of the QR code for a person who is blind. Um, that's impossible. He said he tried really hard but he didn't get it. Um, so it's just that it's those things that, you know, when you're looking at and designing for feedback to ensure that they're reviewed by people who have lived experience, uh, because otherwise you're not going to get the feedback for the people that are actually going to be using a lot of the, the policies and the, and the services. Great. Thank you, Donna. Does anybody have any uh, questions with respect to these documents? Uh, I, I'm not sure how, how much time I, I took a, a brief dive into, into them today. They're, they're quite good. Um, I'm going to suggest uh, from a SEAC uh, perspective for, for providing a uh, feedback next, next month that uh, when, when we are going through these documents throughout the month, sort of, you know, compiling our own feedback on um, on on these documents to also do sort of brief point form notes that we're also able to send to Devika so that we can um, ensure that she she doesn't that nothing's missed that we provide um, that would be great uh, Devika, sorry your hand is up go ahead <laughs> sorry I missed that yeah, no worries. Thank you so much. I just wanted to um, thank, thank Trustee Edwards for her comments. And also just wanted to clarify that when we do the launch now, there is a, a summary. Um, what, what I'm, there is a summary as part of the consultation plan. So it's one, a one pager, maybe a little bit more of what the policy is about. And then a couple of short paragraphs about what each of the procedures are about. But what we also want to develop once we launch the policy are more detailed process guides. And that's where uh, that would be something that's coming later so that people understand what their options are in the process. But for the consultation, um, there are summaries already available that will be part of the consultation uh, launch. And really appreciate your feedback on, on the other pieces as well in terms of ensuring that we're getting feedback um, from, from people with lived experience to make sure that that feedback is incorporated in this design phase as well. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? No? Okay, well, we look forward to having you back in December to uh, provide the feedback on these on these documents because they, they look, they're, they're quite, they're quite extensive, but they look quite good too. So that's, that's good to see. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to move on uh, to number 12, which is the open discussion period. Uh, we don't have anything formal on the agenda, which is probably good because we're, we're, running, we're running a little bit behind today. Um, one of the things I would like to, to mention, though, is, you know, as a part of the, the, the original package with the minutes, et cetera, we did receive the documents for, um, from the ministry with uh, respect to the guide to remote learning. Um, and it, it has an educator's tip, a parent tip sheet and a student tip sheet. And um, 
I, you know, we, we certainly want to see if we can get those circulated to throughout, you know, maybe our organizations as well to get them out to the public. Um, and if you have any suggestions uh, with respect to um, how the uh, board can, can sort of disseminate this through the population, the general population, that would be great if you could just let uh, myself and uh, you know, email myself and Lisa, and we'll make sure that that gets passed on. Um, and it, if anybody has any questions with respect to those documents, uh, if you've had a chance to look at them again, they're, they're also, at least the, uh, the first one is quite long. Um, I know I kind of opened it up and went, oh, I'll have to look at that later. <laughs> So does anybody have any questions with respect to that? No? Okay. Um, we will move on then to the business arising from the minutes. Um, I just want to confirm that, you know, as, and you received a copy of it, our, that our, um, our feedback went back on the K-12 standards. Um, we... Um, need to look at approving the meeting dates for September to December of the 2022-23 school year because our organizational meeting is in December. So if we want to um, take a look at on our agenda, we have September 15th listed, October 20th, November 17th, and December 15th of next year. Does anybody have any concerns with those dates? Um, Donna's usually our our sort of wealth of information on what events might be impacted by that date or that date might impact. Go um, ahead, Donna. But uh, just to note that your, your municipal election is October 24th of, uh, you know, October. Mm -hmm. um, so, and um, um, it, although it isn't, uh, it shouldn't have fucked the, the SIAC date. Um, it's just so aware that that is happening. And then, um, I would say, um, the latest, uh, so, um, the latest, the organizational meeting, uh, can happen for, uh, after the election is, I believe it's, uh, December 5th is the absolute latest, um, uh, because the term, the bill that's Currently, Ford actually has the uh, trustees' terms ending uh, November the fifteenth, but then it's also in the Education Act or until the new organization has been <laughs> uh, has been formed. The new board has been formed, uh, so um, uh, just so you're aware that those are the two dates that I know for around uh, for around those times. They don't really they don't really conflict, but just so you're aware of them. Okay. Um, yeah, because that organizational meeting will be for the board. Our SEAC organizational meetings are December our December meeting each year. So uh, once again, I'd like to stress for our meeting next month. It's really important to have quorum. So if you can't make it to have to, to hopefully have your alternate make it because we, we do elect the chair and co-chair at the December meeting. So um, it's really important that, that we people to attend if they can. Okay. Um, if everybody's okay with those dates, can we get a motion to uh, approve the, the dates for the, for the beginning half of uh, the 2022 school year? 2023 school year. Rowan, any seconders? Donna, all in favor? Okay, excellent. Um, motion passed then. Um, moving on to the association uh, and committee reports. And we did receive an association update from Autism Ontario and, and uh, from Sensor, Sensor Manab. And I actually said, so I'm going to let you speak to it because I think it, it'll be, it'll probably be easier if it actually came from, you can sort of highlight the main points of, of it was circulated to the group, but if you want to highlight the main points for uh, the people watching on YouTube, um, as well as that you can move right into your, your parent involvement committee update. 
Okay, because they also kind of tie together. Thank you. Um, so we have learned that Autism Ontario chapters are moving to a new regional format. This means our chapter will be Dur Durham, York Region, Peterborough, Northumberland, and I think the one more H, it was five of them, all become one. The thought pattern behind this is when um, opportunities to apply for funding become available, they have always talked about what is your reach? How many people can you serve with this funding that you're applying for? So a regional model will put us in line with the expected funding opportunities that are coming in the future. What does that mean for our chapters? This is brand new. Um, we've only had one meeting where they've introduced it to us, but the chapters will still run as they have. All of us that were board members are now volunteers. They have somebody who's going to be the chapter and volunteer supervisor. That's a paid position the program and volunteer coordinator, the fund and volunteer coordinator, as well as the family coordinators that help um, individual families navigate services will still remain with each chapter. Each chapter will still be uh, responsible for their own funding um, and their fundraising should go back to the chapter that has raised it. But they're all still working through it. I did include the information, though, because I wanted to give you the contact information for the new players, right? So their emails and their phone numbers are all left on that. They stated that on November 5th, they were going to have um, uh, a social media post up, and that social media post just came out this week. So they are just beginning to inform families. They are saying that our... Um, our chapter social media pages will be taken down and moved to this one amalgamated regional one. So if you have families who are saying they can't find us on Facebook or I think it's on Facebook that we've moved back to a regional model and you can always send them out to me. So what was interesting about this is I used to attend this on a Tuesday and on the Wednesday at work. Um, Autism Ontario is there to present to, to us about all the new funding available for families. Um, a lot of the answers that were in our question to the ministry. I, um, it was an hour long presentation, hard to give a synopsis, but um, I know I was in touch with Kyla to make sure that the right information gets to the right hands, right? Um, I did suggest though that we do something for parents to help them navigate through these new service options that they have, um, I was thinking in the new year. I finally got back information from um, our, our players at Autism Ontario, and they are on board too. Um, but then when I was sitting on the PIT committee, see how these two just blend into one, right? I attended the PIT committee yesterday. It was a, a great meeting, and we have decided on the second Wednesday of December, February, April, and May. I just want to have that on our radar, just in case there's things that I should be taking back to the PIT committee from this table. At that meeting, they said that we need to pick um, what committee we want to be on. And I'm bringing it back to you, the table, because I'm representing all of us here. So there's a committee that does newsletters. I thought if we were doing, new, if I was on the newsletter committee, how would that look from a SEAC perspective? I guess we'd be adding a tidbit from our lens to the newsletter every month. They have another committee that's uh, the grant committee, and I believe they are the ones that approve the grants that go through the, I think it was a PRO. They have Parents as Partners, which is a large day symposium where they have a lot of different things for um, the parents that attend, um, have children attending DDSB. I uh, thought, yeah, that's something that we should have representation there. And it sounds like that 
symposium goes on every single year. And last year it was done virtually. And then there's the parent involvement committee. And that is a little bit more frequent, but not always focused on our lens. So if we had those four committees to choose from, where do you think our time is best placed? And if I could add, I, I say it like that because remember I had the thought that maybe we should do um, an education session for parents uh, who have children with a child diagnosed with autism. Um, parent involvement committee is going to be doing things like that. I think there's partnership opportunity for SEAC and the PIC committee. I know, I know that the parent involvement committee puts on the is I think there's three regional SECs that they put on and often they have presentations at those. So it, it, that is the parent involvement piece. That right. Would, that's the parent involvement sorry. piece. Yeah. Um, anybody have any input on that? Uh, you know, I'm super glad we have a representation on the parent involvement committee now because uh, I think it's huge. Um, because that was that voice I think they were also missing. Um, I like I, I I'm I'm tossed between the committee, the you know sort of the you know you're you're talking the parent involvement committee would be the focus on what's happening at the the regional meetings, and then there's the parents as partners symposium, which is also huge and hugely attended. Yeah, so that's a toss up. <laughs> you know. Go ahead, Donna. Um, I always thought that the committee members, they actually could be on a couple of them, but uh, am I wrong? They could be on a couple? The they question is the bandwidth. They definitely said that our talents will be stretched thin. Yeah. Okay. Because I, I think those are the two key ones. Yeah, those are the two. Um, I, I, you know, in, in my opinion, where we can reach to reach out to parents, um, because I know the parent um, uh, symposium is hugely attended. Um, and I, you know, I've always thought that there's al always should be at least one session there, you know, as far as that's concerned. Um, and the regional meetings, uh, again, to it, it would be nice to see um, sort of a consistency throughout the year of having something happen. Um, honestly, when it comes to newsletters, I don't know how many people read newsletters. I'm sorry. You know, you can put it, and, and, and who says anybody, we could write a, a thing that promotes one of the sessions or whatever. That would be more. Um, um, I would say that those two seem to be the most impactful and where we, we will have some one-on-one -on -one time and be able to share resources and talk to parents uh, with children with, uh, with special needs across the board. Thank you, Donna. I was thinking the same because when I think of us having a representation there, I don't just think of ASEAC, but I also think of each one of us or some of us represent a community agency that we could also be representing at the regional SECs and in the in symposium. Yeah, like I... Uh I, I, yeah, those would be my two, uh, if you have the bandwidth for them, um, you know, and always happy to be a sounding board uh, for any, you know, sort of assistance you might need with, re that, with respect to that. I'm sure most of us would be happy to be sounding boards for that or support you in that role too, right? Um, and I mean, our goal with SEAC is to you know, one of the goals we've had is is to increase the awareness of our existence and our the organizations that sit on this committee, so that parents know there's more resources out there that that they that there's you know community resources that maybe they don't don't know exists. So, yeah, those are the two I would like to see. 
I think I'll take the major minor approach. We're all major in the regional and minor in the symposium because the symposium is going to have a broader reach. Mm -hmm. And we've, we have in the past done a breakout room, uh, I believe back in the day when Andrea was uh, still special education officer, we did a breakout room on with SEAC and special education uh, at that, at that uh, symposium. So um, yeah, I think that would be great. Thank you. Any so glad you're there. <laughs> I forgot to add the best part about my update with Autism Ontario. All of those changes, and I get to keep coming here. I made sure of it. I confirmed it with them that I will continue to be your SEAC rep. That's fantastic. I would be very sad <laughs> if you weren't. If you weren't, because you do bring great information and, and really concise and, and helpful. So I think that's great. Did you want that added, that report that you sent to us? Is that, did you want that added to the minutes sort of as an attachment or? Yes, because I think the, the most important part of that communication was the contact information for the yeah. new players. Yeah. Okay. So we can add that. That way it gets posted on the website as well. Yes. Thank okay. you. Does anybody have any questions for Sense of Renap? No? Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we're moving on to then the correspondence. Uh, we received a letter from Halton with respect to uh, the remote learning. Um, oh, it refers to the guides and stuff like that, which we have, we've talked about already. Um, for some reason, and I, I, I couldn't find it when I was looking for it today, but I thought there was two letters on, on the quads that have been written by, by CX with respect to some of the concerns that I, I sort of actually brought up at the, the end of you know, sort of the last school year, um, you know, with respect to the, the, the time, the length of time of uh, the quads for students with special education needs, in particular kids with learning disabilities and how exhausting it can be for them to, to have a two and a half hour class. And then, and now, you know, then a lunch break and then another two and a half hour class. Um, and that, you know, mentally sometimes they're coming home at the end of the day, burnt out. I'm, I'm hearing that a fair amount. Um, and also just the compressed time of it. You know, you're doing two lessons in one. So if, if a child is missed today uh, for an appointment or something, they've missed two classes right? It's not just one, it's two. Um, so it's, um, so it looks like it, this is coming to the attention of other SEACs. And, and I don't know if we want to follow suit and uh, as a SEAC and, and sort of write our own letter uh, supporting that, you know, the idea of returning back in the, in the new year to a traditional model of a, of a semester as opposed to staying with the quads. Um, uh, first, I saw Donna Edgebean with her hand up. So we'll go with Donna and then with Kathy. Sorry, I'm new, but I just I have a question. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if any uh, data was collected on success, like now that the semesters have ended, about students with exceptionalities and how they did manage, like was data collected and how did they fare? Because coming from the college um, Durham College. Um, I know our students at the college level um, prefer our smaller classes where they have maybe an hour and 15 times three during the week opposed to, you know, a three or four hour class like the universities have. So um, just kind of curious as to how they fared with that, because I can only imagine uh, ADHD or someone who's trying to regulate, you know, trying to sit in a spot for that length of time could be very difficult. Yes, go ahead, Andrea. Thank you. Great question. Uh, thanks, Donna. Um, we're working through because the quad just flipped um, from quad one to quad two. And I think we, we've heard both sides um, from families. Um, so we have heard from some that um, the pace when we're moving at the 75 minute period, like the double on the 75s um, is very quick. Um, we have heard from a smaller group um, that the focus on two subjects um, allows for a deeper engagement in the content. 
Um, the trend, and again, I would go to um, Anthony and Don living it uh, on a daily basis uh, in their leadership. Um, it seems to depend on the connection with the content and if it's a preferred subject or it's a subject of greater challenge and what other responsibilities that the, the, the youth holds. Um, so for some of our kids, um, when we were holding to morning being one subject and afternoon being the other, um, another responsibility would always sit against one or the other uh, in terms of the time in class. Um, so we're just working through credits um, and, and those pieces, and uh, we'll definitely bring that back to SIAC uh, to get you a firm answer to your question. Um, but I would like, uh, Eva, with if it's okay with you, um, if Don or Anthony wanted to comment on that from school level. Yes, please. Hi, I don't mind um, uh, jumping in and answering. Just, uh, I think it, it, I, what uh, Superintendent McCauley had mentioned, it really does depend on the, the student and the, again, preferred course versus a non-preferred course um, and, and also outside commitments and things. Um, I, I echo the sentiments about missing two classes when a student is away for a day. You're not really just missing one. You are getting behind with the two. So uh, that is definitely a concern. I think another concern that too also is, you know, as the students are moving up the grade levels, when we're looking at preparing them for post-secondary, um, being used to having to take more than just two courses. So I think that that is a positive piece that some of our grade 12s and even some of our grade 11s are looking at too about that they're really looking to be able to focus on that time management piece as well when you're doing um, when you're doing uh, multiple courses. Um, but uh, that's just kind of what I'm seeing so far and hearing on the just on the ground. Uh, I'm not sure if Anthony has anything that he also wanted to add, but I to this. Yeah, um, I. <laughs> I would um, agree with everything that was said. The one thing that I've been that we've at, at Henry Street been paying attention to is our junior students' literacy and numeracy development. So, students who are taking um, English and math, yeah, or English or math in the first quadmester will go many months before they see English or math again um, in in their next grade, grade ten or grade eleven. And so, it's just about um, just kind of planning for a uh, quadmaster two or three or four where they don't have the English or math, planning for their literacy and, and numeracy development opportunities in classes in subsequent quads and also in, um, you know, when we can with, with, with our students um, grab them for, like I'd mentioned before, some of those nights where we do, um, you know, game nights and subliminally adding some of those literacy and numeracy development uh, pieces. Okay, thank you. Kathy, I saw you had your hand up. Sorry, I was just going to add that um, I know the ministry has been talking about, um, has opened it up to public health units to determine which school boards would be allowed to go back to semesters. So if that hasn't come across your screen in other venues, I'm happy to say it because I've heard it outside of the DADSB that public health has going to be given the permission. So I don't think we necessarily have to be in the letter writing campaign. There we go. It's been reported on CBC. So I'm hearing it in different venues, but um, we're not probably looking at one size fits all models that boards are having to take to only allow two classes per day. However, I think that the fact that there is that mixed response illustrates how the semester also was a one-size-fits-all approach that doesn't support every learner. And if nothing else, it teaches us that maybe having different models that maybe coexist rather than one model is some of the learning that needs to be taken back. Because I appreciate that a lot of people will have a sigh of relief. Um, there are some students that fewer sets of class rules. You only had two teachers telling you what the rules are to follow rather than four teachers with four sets of rules um, was easier to manage. Two relationships to build and lean into versus four. So I think that whether your um, lens suggested it was better or worse, if we could start to maybe talk about having the ministry looking at providing more opportunities for flexible programming, that would be great. 
because I've taught in quad masters for nine years off and on. And what's great is if a kid is not doing well in a semester, a quad master allows for a pivot mid year and not wait five months to pivot. So I'm glad that we're not going to all be forced to, to do one model that isn't working for many learners, but I also think it, there might be some learning to be reflective on and that we shouldn't lose that information and data that's being collected. And that might be maybe where we need to talk more provincially with them. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you, Kathy. Kyla, I see you, you have your hand up there. I was just going to jump in uh, with the parent lens in that I'm also a parent of a grade 12 student in the DDSB and just received an email from the director telling us we absolutely will be in semesters for semester two based on the announcement from the ministry today. Okay, great. Well, thank you. I guess that answers that question and makes any writing of that, that letter moot. Um, so, Kathy, are you are you suggesting that we we write a letter just to the ministry, sort of saying, you know, we we recommend you look at at the fact that for some students it it helped them, you know, allowed them to thrive, while other students struggled with it. Some students it helped, and that maybe they should be looking at that uh, going forward as, as you know, for some flexibility. Did we, did we want to do a letter like that? I don't know if it's the ministry. I think it might be the board. The fact that we're saying okay, we're all going to semester. I appreciate the timetabling concerns, mm -hmm. but the fact that we are pivoting back to an old way of doing things and not maybe taking a time to think about, like, did we learn anything? Were there benefits in some programs or in some groupings or in some students' lives? I don't know. Mm. Do we want to maybe hear back from the board next month about this? I don't know if we have something to learn or take away from it. Andrew, did you, did you have something? To I think it, I think it's worthy of consideration and, and to look at. Um, we'll follow the direction of SEAC. Um, it'll be interesting how schools pivot because I think there's a couple pieces too, right, in terms of kids that had sequenced courses on a four quad model um, and what that does when quad three and four sit on top of each other concurrently. Um, so I know looking at that as well as a potential pivot, right, uh, in terms of how many course spaces can kids access uh, if there needs to be a pivot. So lots to work through. Um, I think what we can do is take it away um, as staff and bring some information back. Um, okay. Because I think at this point, it would be, um, unless Kathy feels differently, uh, I think we do have just a few weeks and can maybe revisit it at our December meeting uh, because it would be advocacy towards the 22-23 school year. And that still gives us a tight window before funding gets announced. Okay. If that makes sense. But um, that, that, that happy sense. If, if, if opinion sits different than um, in terms of time sequence. Yeah, I think, yeah, let's bring that forward next month then for some discussion on that. Okay. Um, Carolyn, I see you have your hand up. Uh. Uh, yes. Um, um, in regarding that sort of pivot back to uh, semester, is there any kind of plan to uh, maybe mitigate the impact on some of the students who, um, whether they it was a good model for them or not, who may now have some difficulty adjusting back to that um, uh, model, and maybe that's uh, having an impact on their learning. So for those who thought, oh, the quadmaster was great, I could focus on two things. Now, um, you know, are we going to see that those students now struggle again with the time management, with the, you know, the course load and whatever, or, and have, have there, are there any extra supports um, available now to provide for those students who, who may struggle in that pivot back to the old um, system, if you will? especially for those maybe who were who came into high school. And so this is all they've known at this point now that, you know, the mm -hmm. maybe the grade nines and tens at this point, going back to that, the what we consider the old model, it'll be new for them because this is all they know in terms of uh, their high school experience so far. Yeah, Ada, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I, I think a couple points. Um, one is news hot off the press. Um, so we do see uh, a ministry that does announce publicly at the same time that memos roll to boards um, and sometimes in that order. Um, so hot off the presses, right? So senior team will need to gather, we'll need to gather with our system leads um, and in connection and consult with administrators to 
look at the nuances of what the direction is, because sometimes there's that umbrella direction and then what the nuances are um, specific to COVID protocol. So we'll be working through that. Um, I think as a sector, a service sector, um, we've made that move and I'm going to resist using the word pivot, but we've made that change right between models and shifts um, numerous times over the last 18 months. So we've learned a lot with each of those shifts. So um, for instance, when schools went into closure with the exception of our, you know, almost 400 friends uh, that remained in programming last late last spring. Um, so we've learned many things each time of those system-wide transitions. Um, one of the transition supports that we were talking about earlier this week um, with, with the impending vaccinations for five to 11s um, is our commitment that we would be offering parents at that point of vaccination um, who want to come back from DDSB at home into in-person a chance to do so. So we were talking around this, the supports that would be required um, for students that have never been in a school building for our littles uh, who have only known education through DDSB at home um, for students who have been over with DDSB at home for a significant amount of time. And what, what would we do as a system to specifically focus around transitions? And I think that goes back to Director Marsh's comment about the senior team's orientation to understanding and, and continually learning more about our kids in supporting the system and the transitions piece is certainly one of them. So I would anticipate, but I am getting ahead of a conversation on this one. Um, that we would be doing same and taking that thinking around an elementary transition and also applying it to any change in secondary, looking at where do we need to augment support, lean deeper, um, and who do we need to specifically think of in different ways based on how that specific transition uh, may impact them, um, both with some kids looking forward to it and other kids kind of, as, as Kathy was sharing, like losing their bearings a little bit, that they've had the stability built within the quad model. And so how do we um move that um so lots of planning ahead i will add it to my list for updates <laughs> to SIAC uh in the admin and department report for december thanks andrea you're welcome donna go ahead yeah i was going to say that yes that was hot off the press and, and not you know the the memo basically said that boards will decide and in conjunction with their local health uh uh, basically uh, sector, right? Because um, there are some cases where they will still continue on with the quad master based on uh, COVID rates, vaccination rates. Uh, staffing is another issue um, uh, when making these changes. Um, and I know um, uh, Andrea talked about, uh, and it's the, the data collection that, that they're just getting as, as we've just finished <laughs> one quad and switching over to the second and that there are, you know, I, I've heard uh, emails from both sides of parents, you know, actually liking the quad master and others that have not. Um, and, um, you know, what are the learning gaps, that, you know, as far as because you had that extra time, what were we able to address some of the learning needs and gaps that might have appeared in, in a, a regular semester system um, um, because you had that additional time with students, right? So there's a lot of data that still needs to be looked at. And uh, as I said, it was just announced today. So um, looking forward to having that discussion, but there's a whole um, it's not on, only around learning needs, it's also around have, how we need to pivot the whole system, including transportation, uh, et cetera, staffing, being able to meet those needs. Because, I mean, you've heard we've had shortages, um, busing we had to move. And I can tell you that um, even if when we're doing busing, we'll stay secondary, we'll all times, we'll still stay at 10 o'clock. Because there's no way we would be able to change that at this point in time. Uh, and just to mention on bell, bell times are being reviewed uh, for next year as well. That was part of the Dur uh, student transportation um, report for next year because we still, uh, COVID protocols still exist. We still cannot, uh, what the ministry called, what is considered overloading our buses. Uh, to meet the needs. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's a complex uh, model and 
unfortunately, our superintendents will be very busy over the next little while um, trying to get feedback and consult, consult with staff and, and et cetera, trying to get a plan that meets ev basically meets our needs. Um, it's There's a lot of uh, cogs in, in the plan to to get all working together. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Donna. Um, and and I, I, I just, uh, Lad, I noticed in the chat, apparently Durham College has three models, online, hybrid, and flex. So, um, you know, which is, is, is great options. But yeah, I guess staffing can be a, a bit of an issue because of how it's funded through the public school system, right? For class, you know, with, cla with respect to class sizes, et cetera. Local agreements as well. Yeah. So a lot of, there's a lot of chess pieces involved in it. Um, so, and, and just as a little, you know, as aside um, to both uh, Donna and Krista, please feel free to jump in and ask questions always. Don't, no need to apologize, nothing to do with it. That's why we want you here. We certainly want your voices. That's, I think we think you guys bring some, pretty great perspective. So I, I know I took a couple months for when I joined SEAC to sort of, you know, fit, see what was going on and, and sort of gain my bearings. But please, if you have any questions, always feel free to jump in and ask them uh, because it's really important. Um, all right. Um, okay. Well, I guess I, that answers the question about the letter and, and uh, we'll wait to hear back uh, next month. Andrea on sort of from you guys on on sort of what the plans are and 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 those discussions uh, from from the board level. Um, okay, so moving on there, um, moving on to community concerns. Does anybody have any community concerns to bring forward this month? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. Um, okay, then moving on then to celebrations and successes. Does anybody have a celebration or a success to bring forward? Oh, go ahead, Donna. I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to categorize it as celebration or success, or, uh, or success, but I just wanted to, to note as, as you said, you know, December is the organizational meeting. So I want to just take this opportunity because uh, I have no idea whether I'll be back or not because we have our organizational meeting, but um, I have been so impressed with, with uh, our members here. It's been absolutely amazing working with you. And if I, I, have, I mean, I have intention that I would like to come back. I have withdrawal <laughs> if I don't come back to SEAC. I've been on SEAC for so long, uh, but I, I've been so impressed and, and appreciate all your views and the hard work that you put together. You're a very hard work group. You, re, um, you reflected and advocate for your groups extremely well. Um, I really would look forward to coming back and working with you again, but we'll see what happens at the organization meeting. Well, our fingers are definitely crossed. Darlene, did you, were you going to say something? Yeah, I forgot. <laughs> that, that was, <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I may not be back either. We'll have to fight off the uh, competition for the, the SEAC um, reps. So we'll, we'll see. <laughs> but it is um, so um, heartening, uh, like Donna said, to, 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 to see you all here and to, to have your advocacy. It is incredibly important. And yeah, it's it's an honor to to be here with you. So thank you. Andrea, I see your hands up. Um, just a thank you to you both. Um, same, uh, it is um, for the members new around the table, our two tr trustee reps are both former SEAC chairs. Um, so that perspective uh, in terms of what you bring personally, um, but also that perspective and investment um, in advocacy um, for the kids and for programs. Um, so just uh, my own uh, personal and professional uh, appreciation for the role that you both have around the table as well.
Thank you. And, 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 I, and I'd like to echo it. I, I hope we see you both back. Um, I, I, I love the fact that uh, special education needs and advocacy, you know, is really sort of very deep in the board because of, of you guys being trustees and uh, your involvement here. And uh, so I'm, we're, we're hoping, you know, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Um, does anybody else have any successes or or uh, celebrations to bring forward? Well, okay. Well, then we can move on to number eighteen, which is the adjournment. Does anybody want to make a motion to adjourn? Is anybody going to make a motion to adjourn? <laughs> Rowan, <laughs> seconded by Darlene. All in favor? Oh, I see Carolyn's hand up there. Thank you. Um, okay, so our next meeting, uh, SAC meeting is December 16th, 2021. And we'll see you all here. And uh, thanks for everybody for coming out tonight. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you.